get more people in this meeting than when we leave place now at the great facility. So I thought, okay, why not have to see a lot of our uh, board seven representatives uh, here. Uh, Mayor Sober is here uh, tonight. And he's going to say a few words. But the big topic tonight is what the chief is going to bring to us. I've been to one of his presentations. He's very animated, excited, enthusiastic. Uh, a good message to bring to everybody. I think he's going to give us some words of wisdom as to how to protect ourselves and what we're going on with the city. Microphone. I am here. So, um, anyway, I think it'll be a good meeting. You'll be able to hear everybody else with me. So, uh, Mark, you want to come forward for comments? Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, BJ and uh, thank you for hosting this this afternoon or this evening uh, it's great to see all of you out here tonight uh, this is uh, one of many that Chief Buckner has done that talks about our police department and uh, the opportunities and challenges that we face from a law enforcement standpoint many of these conversations also turn to the other bigger broader issues which deal with our community and I want you to know that uh, we've launched uh, an action plan to reduce violence and to uh, invest in community in our neighborhoods. And that's called Little Rock for Life. Uh, there should be some of those documents here at the, at the uh, community center. If not, we'll make sure that they are. We just got, we just got it reprinted. Uh, but it really deals with six pillars or six foundational pillars that are all critical to the improvement of our community. Uh, three of them really kind of deal with the law enforcement issue, and the other three deal with all of the other important issues. So, uh, obviously, one of our first objectives uh, that we have seen is uptick in violence. So, it's the first objective is really to stop the violence and to put in place various types of policies and procedures, a, a real action plan to try and, and bring peace to the streets. And there are several points in that. Uh, the second one is to strengthen the police department, and that is obviously to grow our ranks to deal with the issues of the challenges that our police force have in terms of finding qualified candidates and refilling our ranks, uh, which is not immune to many cities around the country. And then finally, uh, we've, uh, we have a, a crime, capital crime prevention task force in place for over a year, and we came up with several changes in the laws and several system changes, whether it be not only with the executive branch, which is the police department, uh, be it the legislative branch, which is our legislature and passing laws that are going to be more effective than what we currently got, or, or ultimately dealing with the judicial system and figuring out how we can try and uh, make impact changes that are positive through the courts and through our judges. So, and then on the other side uh, of the aisle, very importantly, we're dealing with the issues of prevention and intervention programs. Many of you have heard about those programs and the hundreds, literally thousands of kids that we deal with on, a, on an annual basis. And uh, so we've got a whole series of specific bullet points about prevention and intervention. Uh, obviously, jobs, education, and opportunity are critical. We know that poverty and lack of education are drivers of the issue of people not having any hope, not having any future, not having any sense of value or self-worth. And we know that the consequences of that often turn to violence and we see that in our streets. So we've got an action plan dealing with those issues of jobs, education, and opportunity. Some of you know about our city felony reentry program. Uh, we just announced through our Workforce Development Board uh, a $1.2 million grant that we got from the Department of Labor. Uh, our Workforce Development Board is a city board, and uh, we are going to be able to take 150 people who are felons, uh, people on probation and parole, and do intensive skill training and development for them in order to make sure that they don't reoffend. Uh, it's a really big deal. We've been working on that for a long time. So not only is the city doing that, but we've got uh, we got work with our house and Goodwill, all who are doing those same kind of things in terms of trying to help people who need a second chance. Uh, and then and then uh, finally, uh, uh, um, improving our neighborhood. And we know about that. We know about our code enforcement. We know about the lab data houses. We know about all of those kinds of things. Um, we're going to be announcing this in a much bigger way, but we got a big, we got a big opportunity, a national recognition grant uh, program through AmeriCorps that's going to start up here in, in, uh, in September. 
we'll be telling you more about that, but we've got many, many programs that we're doing trying to fix up uh, neighborhoods and fix up income. For example, uh, Southwest Silver Rock has really been helpful with uh, a program that we've had for many years now called World Changers, where we have several hundred <coughs> kids who come in for two weeks and uh, they come in, we fund them through our community development block grant monies for the materials that are necessary, but they go in and they fix up, paint up, clean up, and repair homes for people who are retired on fixed incomes in some of our more challenging neighborhoods. And in two weeks, they did 27 houses. When God sent a change, a tremendous partnership with, with, with young people, uh, we provided the materials and they provided all the labor. That's just one example. So I would encourage you to uh, get the action plan, Little Rock for Life, and read through it because the chief's going to tell you a whole lot about the police department right now. But that's just a big. That's just one piece of the plan for what we want to do to try and bring safety to our community. With that, thank, thank you, Mayor. DJ Chief Buckner. It's thank all yours. You. I want to recognize Gene Fortson. I saw him come in. Gene's in the back. He's one of our ones. And then our city manager, he's hiding back there, but he's here tonight. And Chief, if you'll introduce your staff, then you've got the floor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening. Good evening. That's a good response. Uh, this is Chief Finks. Chief Finks is over our uh, field services division, which is the uniform. Uh, portion of the agency. I'll do a little bit of a breakdown of kind of how we're departmentally structured later, but he's over the uniform division. Uh, this is Captain Mac Max Spriggs. Uh, Captain Max Spriggs is over the Southwest Division, which uh, many of you are uh, familiar with, and he serves at the rank of uh, a captain, which all of our division uh, commanders serve at the rank of captain, and Max is one of them uh, for Southwest. Uh, the other folks around the room, various uh, uh, people that we have here are uh, serving either Southwest or our public information office. Now, uh, first of all, before we get started, uh, the purpose of this exercise is for us to be able to give you some information about some of the things that are going on in our community so that when you're more informed, you can be more engaged. Uh, we need the public's help uh, to assist us in many of the challenges that we have. Uh, the Southwest Division is a very, very uh, active part of the city. Uh, you all very much so work with police. Uh, I, I can't pick favorites uh, because when I do, when I go to other parts, of the town people say well what about what we do but I can tell you that Southwest is second to no one when it comes to community engagement I think I said that politically correct <laughs> now uh, Miss Atcock just came in too uh, now one of the things that we want to uh, start with first slide please uh, so when we talk about the police department, one of the things that we're often asked is how does the police department compare uh, it to the citizens that we have in our city versus the officers that make up the Little Rock Police Department? So are we reflective of the community that we serve? Uh, now, if you look at the, the slide there on the uh, box on the left, uh, that gives you a breakdown based upon the 2010 census for the city of Little Rock. Uh, which basically the, it says that 46% white, 42% uh, black, 6.76% uh, Hispanic, and uh, just shy of over 2.5% of Asian, and then you see other uh, represented there. Uh, the box on the right is the makeup of the police department. So we're 64% white officers, 30% African American, uh, just shy of three and a, over 3.5% Hispanic, and then you see Asian, uh, just over a half percent, and then American Indian or Alaska Native, uh, close to 1%. Uh, gender uh, for our police department, 82% of our police agency is male uh, in comparison to uh, nearly 18% female. Uh, the national average for women in law enforcement is about 14%, so we do pretty good uh, with females. Obviously, you see that we have uh, room for improvement uh, as it relates to our black and brown communities, which is uh, historically a tough sell in those communities because the, the honest truth is, is that's also where many of our challenges lie and a lot of the mistrust and some of the things that we have uh, in the community lie in those areas and it's very difficult to recruit in those areas, but you can see that we're still at 30%, that that's a very respectable number for our police department. Next slide. 
uh, officers. Uh, we're now we just updated this uh, slide today based upon uh, recent uh, exits uh, that we've had. So we're an authorized strength of 593 police officers. That's our authorized strength for sworn. There's another 144 for civilians. Uh, there are currently 80 officer vacancies, uh, and then there are 22 <laughs> civilian vacancies. Uh, the vast majority of the civilian vacancies are in communications, where you call dispatch, either emergency or non-emergency numbers, uh, to be able to get in contact with public safety, police, fire, or EMS. Uh, so that's an area uh, that, that's very, very important to us. It's also an area that I significantly want to highlight uh, that we have a significant need of Spanish speakers in the communications uh, arena. So if you know any individuals who are fluent in Spanish, uh, they are a U.S. citizen, uh, and they have an interest in working in, in public safety, but they don't want to carry a badge and gun, communications is a great avenue to be able to do that, and we have a significant need uh, in that area. Next slide. So how are we addressing our vacancies? It's one thing to have uh, the vacancies that we have for the police department, and then the next question is, well, what are you doing about it? So there are a number of different things that we're doing. Uh, first is we, we had a study done by the International uh, Association of Chiefs of Police come in and do a kind of a 360 degree assessment of our recruiting, hiring, application, retention process. And from there they gave us a list of things that are considered best practices, uh, an evaluation as to where we set, and then kind of a roadmap to get to those best practices. Based upon that, uh, the city manager put in place uh, a $5,000 incentive for new recruits. So there's a 24-week academy that you'll learn a little bit about later, that once you graduate from our 24-week academy, you receive a check for $5,000 on your date of graduation as an incentive to come to the city of Little Rock. Next, we wanted everyone in the police department to be a recruiter. It just can't be uh, the police department, just can't be public works. Everyone has to do that. So any city employee uh, that recruits someone to be on the police department, and then they make it to the academy class on day one, that employee will receive receive a check for 500 bucks as an incentive to all city government employees to become active in recruiting. Uh, historically, we, we would do two classes, spring and fall. We're now going to do three classes a year, and that doesn't include our certified officers uh, course, which are officers who have been accredited at another police department. We put them through an abbreviated police academy for Little Rock, and then they're able to hit the streets quicker. So it doesn't include that. So we went from two classes to three classes a year. Uh, then you see the certified officers class that we'll also be uh, having intermittently. Uh, and then we also dedicated uh, to where we're in the process now of setting up a web page to where you can go that's uh, a link on our home page for the police department but then there's a specific page that we will have with information solely for recruiting and then we're in the process of working with a uh, private sector contractor to set all those things up for us again so that we're reflective of best practices in that area. The next thing is we have a telephone response unit. So why, how does that address your vacancies? Well, when you have limited resources, one of the things you want to do is maximize the efficiency of the officers that you have. So we're in the process, we, we set up a telephone uh, response unit to where there are certain calls for service that we will no longer send a police officer out for very minor offenses. For example, uh, let's say someone stole your kid's bicycle out of your front yard and you want to report a $50 bicycle missing. Well, we were no longer sending a, a, a police officer out to do that. You'll, we will be able to take that report over the phone so that we can maximize the time of our officers for more serious offense, more substantive things that we all think that the police should be putting their time and energy into. The next thing, and then also as a part of that, that, that will be used as a uh, slash cadet program for young people that we will use to kind of grow our own fruit who will be working in this civilian capacity until they're able to turn 21 and then we transition them into becoming police officers. I'll show you a little bit about that later. Uh, next thing we have is our traffic response unit. These will be civilian individuals that have been trained to take traffic accidents. Uh, now the purpose of that is again on a good accident it takes two officers. One uh, to do the accident the other one to kind of block traffic to make sure it's safe for everyone to come through that zone. Well that ties up a lot of valuable time for our police officers so we would rather have civilian individuals doing some of those accidents rather than having sworn police to do that uh, and we just got the paperwork today approved for that so that job will be posted pretty soon and I believe that there will be 12 individuals uh, in that unit in a civilian capacity. All for those last two with the purpose of freeing up police time to do more substantive proactive police work. Next slide. So when you look at our vacancies you can kind of see over the past since 2006 
where we've been on the map for the number of officers that we've had. Uh, again, now is uh, obviously the authorized strength was different in 2006 versus what it was in, in 2016. Next slide. And you can see the different variations uh, from the officer deficit. Uh, and we lose officers for a variety of different reasons, retirement, uh, uh, termination, uh, disability, uh, just, uh, just uh, resigning from the police department because they want to go and do something else. Uh, and it, it averages about 35, 37 officers a year that we lose through normal attrition, which is why it's important that we have three classes a year versus two classes to be able to uh, have a positive impact uh, on these negative numbers going out the door. Next slide. So bureaus, we have three bureaus within the police department. Uh, I gave you the first bureau, uh, which was uh, Chief Finks in the Field Services Division, which is our uniform division. There are also plainclothes detectives that work in those divisions. Then there's the investigative section. Uh, that chief is not here. He's, he's on uh, uh, vacation. But he's over the, the uh, felony investigative crimes, homicide, robbery, violent crime, uh, juvenile, financial, those kinds of things. Those are shirt and tie kinds of guys. Uh, and then there's the Executive Service Bureau, uh, Chief Falk, uh, who is not here. And she's over the section that includes uh, headquarters, property room, communications. Uh, a lot of our civilians are in this section uh, and also headquarters. Uh, so it's kind of a combination of both sworn officers and a significant portion of civilian personnel. Next slide. So we have nine uh, uh, divisions or so within the police department. Uh, the three top there, Northwest, Southwest, Downtown, we're actually in the Southwest Division. Uh, and, and I told you Max Briggs is over there. And then we have our second and third, which is Northwest and the Downtown Divisions. There's major crime, special investigation, training. I told you we have our own training academy that we have. Headquarters, which is property room communications, records and support, special projects and special operations. All of these divisions are headed up by a captain within the police department, which is a sworn position. Next slide. So our police academy. One of the things that, uh, uh, and the reasons, and we had this in my former agency as well, uh, when you're a larger police department, uh, usually the state academy uh, is geared towards kind of giving you a general generalization of the things required to be a police officer. Uh, and, and many of those things will suit smaller or suburban or rural communities. Well, Little Rock is a larger community and we're also uh, the largest city in the state and also an urban community. So there are unique challenges that we face. Uh, in doing so by running our own academy, we're able to get our officers uh, exposed to many of those things that they're going to see uh, at our local level through our own academy, which is why we do our own. So that's a 24-week academy that the individual goes through. Once they graduate from that, there's a 12-week academy that they will be riding with what's called a field training officer. Field training officers, when you see two officers in a car, more than likely, and unless they're working some kind of special detail, one of those officers is being trained. So there's 12 weeks that they go through that, and there's a two-year probationary period uh, from the time of hire that the officers are on or uh, that they're actually on probation. Now, why do we do two years? Because we want to make sure that we have the right people people uh, wearing our uniform, our badge, doing the right things so that they show themselves not worthy of being on the police department. We can have a very quick exit of those indiv individuals if they do not respond to kind of the modifications of behavior that we give them. Uh, we just currently had a class uh, this past Friday, uh, a recruit class of 18 that graduated. What was unique about that, which we're, while we're encouraged about the incentives uh, that the city manager put in place, this was the first class that I'm told in history, I know it's certainly during my tenure, and I think I've hired six or seven classes, but this is the first class that started with a number and then ended with that number. So there were 18 people that started in that class on day one. They went through their 24-week academy, and we finished with 18. And we think, of course, the incentive had something to do with that, but it's encouraging to know that that 10% attrition that we normally have in our classes did not occur in our most recent class, so we retained more people. Uh, and tonight, before I got here, I went to an orientation for our next class that will be beginning on August the 21st. Uh, there are 29 individuals in that class, and then uh, uh, maybe three or four weeks after that class begins, there's five coat officers, certified officers, that will be with them for a total of 34. Uh, if these other individuals pass these last few stages that they have, then we'll be, we will be starting uh, this this month and then later there's a November class that we will be starting hopefully that class will be in the, in the low 40s uh, so the certified officer class I talked about that for uh, officers who are already certified and then we have classes coming up in August and November next slide uh, so the, one of the things when you talk about crime statistics 
police chiefs, uh, one of the areas that you are graded on uh, as a chief is your ability uh, to manage crime. Uh, and there are two categories uh, that people look at when they look at your report card, uh, both as a police agency, a police chief, and then as a city. And they're divided into violent crime and property crime. Look at the box up here uh, on to your right. Violent crime is defined as homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assaults. And then property crimes is burglary, larceny, theft, vehicle theft, and arson. So if you look at total number of reported offenses, you can see the graph here at the bottom, uh, and you can see that last year, total number of reported offenses was 16,954. 2015 was a, an exceptional year for us. It was like a 30-something uh, year low, uh, because not only were we below the line of 17,000, but we were below 16,000 for that year, which is a record year for us. Uh, and then in um, 2014, it was another sub-17,000 year. So why is that sub-17,000 year uh, important? Well, if you look at the graph here, you can see that uh, the mayor has said a number of times during his uh, days as a, a prosecutor, uh, during the kind of the heyday of the banging in Little Rock and some of the worst moments uh, in our city's history, uh, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 27,000 uh, total reported incidents. So if you look at this statistically, you can kind of see where we are in comparison to what those numbers look like in the 80s and 90s. Now what's significant about that, and when we look back over a 20 year period, we see that only four times in 20 years have we been sub 17,000 reported incidents. The past three years, and then also in 2010, we were sub 17,000. Now, so why wouldn't the police department be having more of a celebration and a parade uh, going down the road for these kinds of incidents? Well, for us, you know, these are numbers when you're, when you're doing work. But each one of these numbers has a victim attached to them. And if you were one of the 16,954, you could care less about your little parade or your little celebration that you're having because someone stole my car or someone shot my relative, or someone broke into my home. So even though we've had some success with some of the things that we're doing, and we're certainly having a challenging year this year, it's important to, to understand that there are victims attached to these numbers. Uh, and even though uh, we have good days and bad days, and I, think, I still think that the good days outweigh the bad, but there's a lot of work to be done, which is why it's important for us to have these kinds of meetings so that you have information from us, and then you can be more engaged based upon the information that you have. Now, Here's my warning about meetings. It's like church. It matters not what you do in this meeting. What matters is what you do when you leave here. That's the difference maker. Because if we were going to heaven or hell based on Sunday, everybody would be in heaven. <laughs> heaven is based upon Monday through Saturday. That's what gets you into hell. So what's important is what we do when we leave here as a community. Are you getting engaged? Are you educating yourself? Are you looking out for your neighbors? Are you calling the police when you know something is going on? If you recognize the photo of the individual that we're looking for, are you calling? And I certainly understand that people want to feel safe. People want to uh, not get engaged to where you put yourself at risk. We have a number of different avenues that you can share information with us without exposing yourself and putting yourself at risk, which is why it's important important that not only that you come to these kind of forums, but we have quarterly meetings with our captains, uh, we have constant information that we put out on our websites, and that you stay totally engaged in public safety in your community, because the needle really moves when the community is engaged. Next slide. So crime. So if you look at news clippings, a lot of our crime information comes from some of the violent crime, and, and of course it should, because that's a violent encounter that has happened, and there are true victims with these crimes. But only 18% of our crime is violent crime. 82% of the crime in the city of Little Rock is property crime, and I gave you the property crime areas uh, earlier. Now, why am I highlighting this? The problem and the frustrating thing with us with uh, property crime is much of it is preventable. Example, if I were to send my officers out right now to the parking lot, I will bet you anything. <laughs> and you know where we're going. There's a phone sitting on someone's dashboard. Someone left their doors unlocked. I hope a young lady didn't leave a purse out there. There's a laptop sitting in somebody's car. All of these things are preventable. Don't leave your garage door up. I don't care what community you live in, even if it's gated, don't do it. When it's cold outside, don't warm your car up. If you do, warm it up with you inside it. Because you get frustrated when your car is stolen and you call us back two weeks later wondering, where's my doggone car? Now to us, 
that really was not a theft. That was a donation because you left the key in it. You can't do you can't do that in any city. Not just Little Rock. You, you can't do that in Pleasantville. Leave a car running in 2017 with the keys in it. Don't do it. Please don't do that. Um, next slide. So challenges. So uh, when we look at the police department and some of the frustration that we have, certainly for me as a chief, is because I feel like that, that people take this kind of wheelbarrow, and I'm an old country boy, I hope you all know what a wheelbarrow is. Okay, so they take a wheelbarrow and they roll up to the front door of the police department and they have all of this stuff that's in this wheelbarrow. And they dump it off at the doorstep of the police department and say, Chief, we want you to fix all of these things that are in this wheelbarrow. And what is that? Poverty. Those are some of the common denominators of the things that we're seeing in our community uh, in other communities across the city, and they're certainly prevalent in Little Rock. So you talk about uh, academic achievement. Now, our school system does a great job in, in managing the kids that they have and trying to educate them to get them to their uh, uh, promise and, and, and their possibilities, but they need our help. We have to be engaged with the school system just as much as we do uh, with the uh, police department, even when you disagree with them. Even when you disagree with them, we have to be engaged. Next thing, single parent homes. I'm the product of a single parent. Raised with my mother and my sister and I. Product of a single parent. So I'm not saying that there's not some single parents that do an outstanding job of raising young men and young women. I think my mom did a great job with my sister and I. But I can tell you that as a 48-year-old successful man, there's some conversations that I wish that a man would have had with me. And, and there's something that you miss as a male when there's not another constructive, uh, uh, strong, positive image in that home. You miss something. I can tell you that today as a successful man. I miss some things for not having that. And that's why we encourage uh, for other people, if you want to, the people, I get asked often, well, what can I do to get engaged? Well, Chief, I'm, I'm frustrated by, by what I'm seeing. What can I do to get involved? I tell everybody, start with the kids. If you want to do something to impact our community, do something that impacts young people. It will help us. Next thing, uh, teenage pregnancy. Self-explanatory, don't even need to go into that. Substance abuse and mental illness. Here's some of the thing with that. Now, by no means, please don't walk out of here and think that I'm saying that if you have a substance abuse issue and you broke into my home and you stole uh, $10,000 worth of thing, that we think that you should be able to get uh, uh, a free rehab and no accountability for the, for the harm that you've caused uh, the victim of this burglary. There needs to be accountability for your criminal action. But we don't need to treat addiction with incarceration. That's, that's not the long-term answer for that. Same thing with mental illness. If someone is mentally ill, the jail is not going to solve that. Now, again, I'm not saying to circumvent accountability. You need to be held accountable for your actions, but you don't treat mental illness with incarceration. That's a flawed system, and we have to do something about that. Uh, unemployment. So we're seeing all of these record numbers that sub 4% or so now on these national levels as to what unemployment is. And we're wondering, well, what's the big deal? Or, or why can't everybody just find a job? Well, it's not that easy. Because I can assure you, when you go south of 630, the unemployment rate is not sub 4%. And there are areas in our city that there are other categories that maybe the national model may have some promising numbers. But when you go into communities that have these common denominators, You've got problems. A person who is unemployed is more likely to be engaged in something uh, non-constructive, something criminal, something that is harming someone, uh, which is why I'm a proponent of uh, the um, uh, re-entry kinds of program. So why would the chief of police be sitting up here, uh, and I've even been criticized that, hey, you're doing too much with convicted felons, and why are you over here talking to gang members? And I get all of that. But if gang members or ex-gang members are a part of the problem, or if unemployment is a part of the problem, who do you expect me to be talking to? Amen. Because I'm sitting here talking to you all, but you're not breaking into people's homes. So I have to go to where the problem is, which is unpopular for some people that I spend time in those areas. But if I can get someone, business owner, to say, you know what, I want to be socially conscious. I want to do something to impact my community, and maybe um, I don't have a job to where someone who's been convicted of fraud, you don't put them over the cash register. <laughs> I'm not asking you to do something crazy, 
But, but you can't tell me that you can't find somewhere in your institution that that person can't do something to be able to be able to take care of their family. Now, the other side of that argument. Now, we've also had some folks who have said, well, you know, I want a, I want a livable wage. And then our business community is saying, well, we push back on that. Well, I say to both sides of it, I think that you should offer a livable wage for a profitable job skill. Because don't come tell me, business owner, to give you a living wage, and then the skill set that you have, I can't make a profit off of it, because it sounds great to say, hey, I'm in business and I'm socially conscious. Let's, let's wake up. People go in business to do what? Make money. So if you want to do something, and the city has areas to where you can get job skill, you can get job training, you can go something to be able to better yourself. So we can't have that as an excuse. But there's two sides to most arguments. Uh, last thing, uh, black and brown uh, crime. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, suspects, and, and, and it's well documented that we don't need to go into, into what many of these things look like as we see them play out uh, on our news and in our communities. But let's talk about the disproportion of black and brown victims in our city and across the country. And they are disproportionate black and brown, which is why you have to get engaged. Don't look at this from a standpoint of, well, I don't want to tell on John Doe because uh, I'm not a snitch. Well, you feel that way when your mother is the victim. When you could have stopped that on the first car break in, when you knew he was out there doing that. Look at it from a victim standpoint, that we have to get engaged. You cannot expect us to be the only one out here looking for people. You have to use your eyes and ears to help us. Next thing, police community relationship. The first letter of the word improvement is what? I. So when we're talking about improvement, when we're talking about what needs to be done, the first place I would tell you to look is in the mirror. And we have to admit that some of the mistrust that you have some of the scars that you have have been caused by the police department. We have not always been on the right foot. And that's not all historical. We, someone done something today to where we were not professional, or that we did not treat that person with dignity and respect. So we all have accountability in this, including the police and the relationships that we have with each other. Next slide. Um, 21st century uh, policing model. Uh, we're almost ready to where we're going to post our first, uh, first two quarters uh, of that for our agency because we subscribe to the principles. The, I told you there were six pillars. Uh, the six pillars are building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, community policing and crime prevention, training and education, officer wellness and safety. Uh, all of those are very, very important. Uh, the president and, a, and a, a large group of kind of comprehensive folks around the table from a variety of different uh, avenues came up with things that they said that a 21st century police department should subscribe to uh, if you call yourselves professional. And we're trying to work on that. And when we post that, we invite you to go online to see how we're doing with those different avenues. Next slide. Uh, so youth, I told you one of the things that you want to get uh, involved with, if you ask me, Chief, what can I do as a citizen to get engaged in what's going on? And I said to you, I will tell you to start with the kids. Well, the other thing I will tell you is, is when you have people at the podium and they give you buzzwords, things that sound good and they make us feel good, after they get done talking, look for behavior. Does your behavior match what you said? So I'm telling you to go and get engaged with kids. Well then police department, what are you doing? I'm glad you asked. First thing, we have 19 police officers uh, in the uh, city of Little Rock School District. All middle schools, all high school have officers in them. Purpose, constructive contact with young people to provide programs on things such as uh, drug use, decision making, bullying, um, uh, life skills, all those kind of things, constructive programming being done by police, and then lastly to provide a safe environment for students, faculty, and staff. Uh, and there are also two supervisors. We have the OK program. Uh, it's a mentoring program based upon principles of um, constructive males interacting with young men, specifically African American boys, where we have a number of our challenges. Uh, I began to see a pattern of uh, female issues in our city of young ladies being engaged in serious criminal behavior. 
So much so that it is one of the fastest growing demographics in the prison system. So we felt like we needed to do something to intercede with young ladies. So we took the principles of the OK program, we know it works, and we applied those principles to young ladies and the organization is called GEMS, Girls Empowered uh, by Mentoring and Sisterhood. Uh, then every summer we do a youth live-in camp. We pick them up on Sunday and we return them to their parents on Thursday. They stay overnight with us uh, for a week. Uh, this year we invited 115 kids to that program. These are good kids, good grades, good behavior, and we use it as a reward for them, again, to have constructive contact with police. And I believe, excuse me, 99 kids showed up uh, for the program this year. Uh, the telephone response unit, I told you we have a cadet program. Uh, that's attached to that. This is so that one of the things that you've seen me challenge on is why don't we have more police officers living in the city of Little Rock uh, that actually work for the police department. I agree with that in principle that there are a lot of positive uh, attributes to that system. So to try to grow our own fruit so that we, you, you, uh, you build with people from here who live here, grew up here, they're more likely to stay here. So part of that program is a cadet program and there are eight positions for that. And then we also have a very pro, a good program that we're very proud of that's just getting off the ground. Last year we started working with Mr. Poor in the Little Rock School District out at the Metro uh, Vocational School. They had a criminal justice program. So we attached a police officer to go over there and help them with their curriculum so that we could again grow our own fruit. At the time that we engaged that program we also gave them a brand new used car. And we took that car, did you catch that? It had about 200,000 miles on it, but it was better than the car that they had, but we rewrapped it, it looked brand new on the outside, had a detail uh, on the inside, uh, it works fully so they can practice their traffic stops uh, and things of that nature. And then we went from about 25 to close to 60 kids will be returning uh, for this school year who have signed up for that program. We want to grow our own fruit and we have to be proactive in how we do so. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that. Next slide. All right, this is my last slide before I turn it over to Max Briggs, who's going to give you a little bit more of intimate information about some crime in the Southwest area, and then we'll open up the floor for question and answer. But one of the reasons that I say the Southwest is one of my favorite areas of the city is because you all stay engaged in what's going on. Now, I want to know that the fruit of your labor of staying engaged, it works when you're engaged in what's going on. So I give a, an award each year to the division commander who has the deepest decrease in crime for the city. How many patrol divisions do we have? Three. three. Somebody was listening. Three. Southwest, Northwest, and downtown. Two of the past three years, 14, 15, and 16, two of the past three years, Southwest has won that award. You should be proud of that. And you can see how you can see how that's broken now. You can kind of see how we're tracking right now uh, for for the year for the three divisions. We're right now just under six percent uh, over what we were for last year. We're still. Uh, I'm confident that I think that we can get in the black to have a decrease in overall crime uh, for the year. But it's going to take a lot of hard work for this last quarter. But I just wanted you all to know that your work. Uh, is turning out good things for your division. Stay committed to what Southwest is doing, and I will turn it over to Max Briggs now for a little bit more information. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who do not know me, as Chief said, my name is Max Briggs. I'm the captain of the Southwest Patrol Division, which is right next door. You turn around, that's where I am. And the stats that were up there a few minutes ago, for Southwest, I commend the community because it is not we and you, it is us. That's what made those stats. It's people getting involved, people caring, people committing, the police department and the citizens, or the citizens and the police department, whichever way you want to say it, marry each other and get out here and get the bad guys as much as we can. So thank you for making these numbers like they are. And hopefully, with the lowest so far this year, we got five more months to go. And I'm hoping at the end of uh, 2017, the plaque which is now hanging in the Southwest substation will stay there for another year. And if it does, again, it's, up, it's for the community. Now, population is 50,079, so we're about 25.9, 26% of the population of the city of Little Rock. 
You'll see what it says, Southwest first, second, third shifts, Southwest total, units dispatch, CAD dispatches. A CAD dispatch is the communication sending out a call to a police officer and saying, I need you to go here, I need you to go there. Units dispatched is how many units have been dispatched during those calls. So if you see the total for Southwest, units dispatched is 57,526, and the CAD dispatches are 39,356. The reason that is, is because we send more than one officer. That's for safety for everybody. So sometimes you'll be driving around, you're going, where's everybody? Well, everybody's out answering calls to, to whatever you need us to answer to. Because we take every call we get serious, regardless of what it is. Next slide, please. Okay. This is Ward 7. It's all of the 90 districts. And a little bit of 62, which is up around Ashton University, how it, how it cuts in a little bit. But uh, as you can see, Ward 2 is the 80 district, which also goes up into a little bit of 54. But a large scale of Southwest is uh, Ward 7. Next, please. Now, this is Neighborhood Watch footprint for the 80s, but for the 90s, 91, 92. And as Chief said earlier, Southwest is very, very active, which makes me happy because I know I have people out here in the community that are working. And for those who have come to my quarterly meetings, you know I tout that every time we have one. So thank you very much for that. Next, please. Okay, now these Southwest uh, comparisons 2016. Now 2016, go all the way across, that is raw data, okay? It hasn't been gleaned yet, which means what we do is we take the information reports that we've gotten in, we go through them, and we're seeing if it matches what the call was. Sometimes they get mislabeled, and it takes a little while to go through all those calls that you saw several slides back, right? So not a problem there. Now, the part one offenses, you can see how 2016, 2017, and this is the number difference between the two, right? Now, some people may say, you look at homicide, 75%, and you're going, oh my gosh. Well, remember something. In 2016, you had eight. You had 14 so far, so you're up six. Smaller the number, the bigger percentage is going to be, okay? Because we are matching last year's numbers to this year's numbers, okay? So even though the percentage sign may look enormous, you have to look at the numbers that tells you, okay? So the numbers will be a little bit lower. Um, you can see through there. Okay, next please. Okay, now Ward 7, as you see here, red mark, that is what has happened in the 90, 62, 90, 91, and 92, okay? All the way through, all the way down. Um, we get to breaking and enterings. I'm gonna piggyback a little bit. Hey, ma'am, you need to come in? There's one right over here, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's the latest prerogative. No problem. On the um, breaking enterings into cars, the chief touched earlier, and I'm going to piggyback a little bit on that, about leaving your car unlocked and being wanton victims. There's an article in today's paper that says throughout the United States, there is a gun stolen every two minutes in the United States, okay, from a lot of different areas. One of the things they mentioned is out of cars. Why? Because you do not lock your car. Or you lock your car and you leave your window down. That sounds kind of strange, but trust me, it's happened. In 40 years of being on this job, I've seen that happen. Um, <laughs> And they'll leave it right out where you can see it. You know, and they tell you, if you're going to leave it in your car, leave it in the trunk locked up. But that is another thing that happens that causes a lot of stuff to be stolen. And one of those things we talk about a lot is about 
weapons, well, you can help cut that down by locking your car up, chief said, or in your garage door. It, it doesn't do you a lot of good to lock your house all up and turn the alarm on and leave the window up. They just walk right on in, take what they need, walk right on out before they got that uh, 30 or 42 second delay action. So we have to be a little cognizant of what we're doing. Next, please. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> At this time, we will uh, open the floor for uh, questions that you may have. You can come in and sit down if you like. We have a couple of open seats over here. Uh, we will take questions from the audience at this time. If you have any questions, yes, sir, right here in the front. Have you considered curfew at all? Curfew. I've been asked a, a lot about curfews. Um, I have not seen curfews work uh, uh, in cities from kind of a, a management kind of standpoint. If you have a state of emergency in your city, uh, let's say you're having a Ferguson moment and you want the streets to be cleared each night uh, until the unrest is gone, I think a curfew could be valuable. But from a day-to-day -day maintenance of saying that 14-year-old kid has to be in the house by 10 o'clock at night or you return them to their guardian. Uh, what happens with that is uh, if you have one of the single parents that's working here uh, and it doesn't have a lot of control over the young person that's out doing what they're doing, most of the time there are punitive things attached to that violation for that. So now we're penalizing someone uh, who's trying to do their best can with they, they, they can with their kids uh, and they've been receiving some kind of punitive damage for that. The other part is, is when you have an a, a irresponsible parent that now you're lucky if you can find that parent when I've got the, the child in hand so then you end up taking them to some kind of detention center or something like that introducing them into the criminal justice system for a status offense uh, and I'm just not a big proponent of, of curfews from a day-to-day -day maintenance of a city what is, what is uh, on that same kind of, the school opening up are we going to be as strict or stricter or less strict well, uh, strict as far as I don't understand your question I don't understand your question. The, the kids that, that are not going to school, obviously the, the school system has truancy officers that, that deal with those kinds of things. Uh, we had a truancy officer when I when I came here. We were spending a lot of hours uh, in that position, but when I looked at the data to see how many kids that were actually brought into the truancy center versus uh, what we were paying for the individuals to be there, it just didn't make sense to have someone have that as a full-time job doing that when you may get two or three kids in a school year uh, to come through there because I'm, I have a shortage of officers and I need as many police as I can out on the street. And I saw a hand up. Yes, sir, right here. Uh, the, there's an issue with uh, four-wheelers, dirt bikes, traveling on, on the streets. Yes, sir. Now, it's, it was told to me that officers are not allowed to that's not it's not quite true but I understand what someone told you what, what our policy says that it has to be a felony offense in order for us to be engaged in a pursuit uh, why do we do that well in order for me to justify putting the general public uh, at risk of harm doing a pursuit doing a residential area uh, I can more intelligently make an argument as to why we were pursuing that car if the individual wanted for the stop is wanted for a felony offense for is a traffic offense, uh, popping wheelies or, or uh, a speeding or something like that. Because many times uh, it causes them to kind of take this as a game and they want the police to engage with them in chasing them. Now the frustrating part about that is you as a citizen, you think, well, you just let this kid run up and down the streets on this four-wheeler and, and we think that that's dangerous. So we have a, a level of engagement that we certainly try with many of these youths, but I have not authorized our officers to engage in a pursuit for a misdemeanor offense. And that's kind of where the gap is as to what we can do. But if we, can we cite them for traffic offenses? Yes, we can. Can we pursue them for traffic offenses? No, we cannot. Well, that, 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 so it's dangerous for them to be doing what they do. It is. So when someone dies, that's when you can cite them. But you can't, you can't prevent someone from dying. And, and you're, that's my concern because Myself, I've been startled by them. Mm -hmm. My mother traveled, my, uh, my brother traveled, and, and I would take great issue with 
one of those people mm -hmm. causing them to be injured or, or you know, let alone killed. So that, so that policy of not pursuing, pursuing them, where they have no consequences, it, it, it exacerbates the problem mm -hmm. because more and more start doing it. I mean, at what point do, do you start enforcing the law because they're not, they're not street legal, they're not licensed. Mm -hmm. At what point are, is that policy going to change? When someone dies or before someone dies? Well, our policy is actually liberal. Uh, the, the policy that I had in place, the policy that we have now is considered a liberal policy. Uh, what I mean by that, the level or the latitude that I give my officers uh, is not um, probably consistent with what, what agencies are doing right now, which is making it more strict. The policy that I had before I made the modifications, because of some of the challenges that I was seeing in the community, that it had to be a violent felony, not just a felony, a violent felony. Now, some agencies have went to that. We had that, and we discovered that we were having too many incidents to where people were doing things that put the public at risk, so we said that we will pursue for a felony to make a modification. I'm not willing to do that for misdemeanors. Frustrating to you, and it's an intelligent point. Well, but it's I don't, frustrating, it's dangerous. It, it is dangerous, but it's more dangerous to the public if I pursue every misdemeanor offense that occurs in our city through the residential areas, and you only have to check what happened on Chico Lane uh, a couple of years ago to know what that looks like. But if, 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 there, if, there, if these people receive consequences, then some of them are going to change their behavior. Some of them are not going to do that. I don't disagree but, with but, you, sir. But to not intervene, it, it, it just encourages that type of activity. We, we attempt to intervene. We attempt to intervene. But our current policy is it has to be a felony offense in order for us to pursue that vehicle. But I understand your frustration. Yes, sir. Chief, I have something I want to share. I'm from White County. Yes, sir. Law enforcement officer, and I, I did a little test. And this test is... A pardon application. Yes, sir. This application I pass out to convicted felons who have, who have um, uh, done, you know, their, 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 their crimes and they've paid their fines and restitutions. And what I do as a law enforcement officer, I hand them this pardon application. And you're talking about the change of their behavior. And they say, I never ever would have thought that a law enforcement officer would hand me a pardon application. Mm -hmm. So I challenge all law enforcement officers, if it's something that's in your policy, to, you know, we know who are out on the streets, we know the felons, the people who are out there, they're struggling, they're trying to get their lives back together. Mm -hmm. If we would hand them something like this, it would potentially change the dynamics of how people look at us as law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. So I'm here tonight to share that information with you. In White County, I've had nothing but positive responses from everyone that I've handed this application to. They said, we're a godsend, I'm a godsend, I'm only one officer doing this. Mm -hmm. But the response that I'm getting, Chief, is, is unanimous, and I just wanted to share it with you. I, I'll, I'll take that, and, I, and we will certainly look at to see uh, what that's doing for White County. Do you have any, kind of just very briefly, on, on what the percentage is of individuals who've actually received a job or something as a result of this? Well, Chief, what it does is it, 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 it shows that we are trying to help people change their lives for the better. Okay. And anything that we do positive for people, that opens up a different avenue for us. And I've had nothing but positive response from people. Just because I'm a law enforcement officer and I'm handing them something other, I'm serving them something outside of a subpoena, mm -hmm. an eviction notice, or a warrant for their arrest, I'm handing them something that's good for them, mm -hmm. and they appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's value anytime you provide people information. I, I, I will take a look at it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back right here. Can you explain a little bit more? I have a problem with uh, resource officers yes. in school, so can you uh, explain that to me? I think I would be able to explain it better if I knew what your problem was with resource officers. Well, why, why they can't leave the, the campus when uh, students are in the neighborhood and what their, uh, what is, what, why are they in the school? They're in the school's uh, first purpose, constructive contact. We want young people to come in contact with police in a non-law enforcement uh, capacity. Uh, programming. What, we have a number of different curriculums that we teach the kids doing a block of instruction that are coming directly from the officer to teach that. 
uh, to your point. So then why is the officer not going out uh, and doing some of the things in the neighborhoods with the kids? Uh, there are a number of things that we do during the summer months. For example, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs runs programming during the summer. Many of the kids that we have who are in our Little Rock School District go to Boys and Girls Club to have a place to go during the day while their parents are at work. So we have school resource officers in those facilities, but while they're contracted to be in the school and we do have a contract uh, with the Little Rock School District, our responsibility is to the school and that campus. Uh, for those particular officers. And that doesn't say that officers who are working on the streets can't engage those young people, but the police who are assigned to that geographical location, that's their responsibility. Okay. Yes. Security officers at the school, therefore, so see, I was confused about a resource officer and, and the uh, Little Rock School District uh, security. Yes, ma'am. So I was just wondering why you need to vote for security. But well, it's, uh, it's a great question. It, uh, I can tell you that our young people uh, know the difference between a security officer and a police officer. Okay. Uh, and I can assure you that if you ask a teacher, do they respond differently to police than they do security or a teacher, it's a significant difference. Yes, ma'am. Sir, you mentioned um, the OK program about, um, I believe, Yes, ma'am. You were seeking other individuals or people to get involved. And so I wonder if you heard of uh, Respondability by, with uh, Edmund Davis. I've, I've heard of, I know Mr. Davis. Okay, have you actually reached out to try to see what his program looks like? I think it's something on 27 weeks or something Go to like my that. slides for my vacancies. Mm -hmm. My slides for my vacancies. Second and third. Well, one, I say that because he has a great relationship with some of the police officers. How do I know that I'm yes, going for one? Yes, the other piece is, is that I really strongly feel like Mr. Davison, um, professor at the Arkansas Baptist uh, College, he should be sought out on his relationship with students, even adults, mm -hmm. children at the middle school level. Yes, ma'am. Just to really look at his program because it has been noted nationally as well. So I truly feel like the Little Rock School District and the uh, police department could definitely benefit from what he has to offer. Don't disagree with you. I have 80 vacancies. I struggle to make calls for service. So anything outside of one of my last slide on you? These are the six programs that we have with you currently for the police department. As I gave you my analogy that people roll up a wheelbarrow and they ask the police, can you work with Mr. Ed Davis? Can you go over and do something? Sir, I'm not asking you that. I, I, no, sir, I'm not asking you that. I'm okay. just saying to add another program in there because I know in this particular area, as much as I comb Southwest Little Rock, children are truant, mm -hmm. they don't go to school, yes. law officers have to be involved. I can say that Mr. Edmund Davis came to our school. Okay. Even today, as we started school again, some of those law enforcement have come by to shake hands, yes. how are you, how is school going to go? You said you want something to be positive in the community. Yes. That's another way to start. I talked to Willie Davis. He said in my parents' center, the program is full. I called to Keisha Pfeiffer and asked about girls being in the gym. The program is full. I called in and tried to get my youth into the live-in camp, and it only goes up to age 12. So I'm saying, how about if another couple of things was there for children and youth to be involved? So because all of us can get into these different in, uh, programs right here. Which so I'm just saying, see, I'm not talking about a police officer. I'm saying someone that's noted that can make a difference. I, I, I don't disagree with anything that you just said, yes, sir. which is why I said to the audience, if you want to see more things on the board, you're going to need to do something when you leave this meeting. I don't have the resources to take on another program. <laughs> I, I, just, I don't have to do it. You, you, you're waiting right now for two hours for us to come for a traffic accident. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. 
great program, great constructive interaction. Ed Davis has a passion uh, for young people, but I need community people to get behind Ed Davis if we want to see Ed Davis's program explode to, to go and do bigger and better things because the police department is taxed with our number one responsibility of public safety. So I'm asking, do we need to go to the mayor and say, Mayor, well, all six of these things I think you're doing, uh, I believe, Professor Davis, would you stand up, please? Professor Davis is right here. I would say to you, Mayor Stone, if you will, if you will, I'm saying to you, Professor, because I know how outstanding and what a impact you made in South Little Rock. I'm saying to you, sir, please, would you go to Mayor Stone and try to get responsibility to make something happen out here for our children? Thank you so much. Please. Next question, young lady in the back. Okay. Um, I don't know the, all of the different ages uh, per se for each program. I can get that to you. I have someone uh, in the back get your information. I'll get that to you. But it's, it's mainly uh, certainly under the age of 18. There are many. Uh, there are some kids that are in OK who come back as mentors themselves uh, who are college kids. Uh, we're also trying to get some of the OK kids and then also the criminal justice metro Bow tech kids to pick them up once they've graduated for high school for the uh, telephone reporting unit. Uh, but, but I can get you the exact age for each program. Okay. Yes, ma'am, right here in the middle. Okay, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Like all these break-ins, this is like a prior opportunity for quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. The officer said that a dispatch had sent them two and a half miles away to a Walmart that's on the other side of the 430 and the 30 from us to drive up and down looking for that particular car. And I'm thinking it was here in my neighbor's driveway twice, and then I saw what direction it was going. The, the example that you provided sounds like a, a mistake in communication. Uh, I don't think that's a procedural issue other than uh, it sounds like that incorrect information was given to the officer that was dispatched to your original call for service. That they made a, the dispatch made a mistake sending them somewhere. To the wrong location. Yes, ma'am. I can allow the officer to do what? To decide. Oh, they're getting the report that's actually happening right now. Now they've come back. They're still at the scene, but they can decide to go to the scene and get the person. Well, if, if you're, from what you're describing, was, a, was an active break-in in progress, uh, that should have been a high-priority call for service, which means that it should go uh, to the top of the list because the crime is actually ongoing. So there's not a lot of discretion that the officer would have to make that call uh, because you want to get there as quick as possible for what you're describing. For the information that was given to you, it sounds as if that the officer went to the wrong location first, which resulted in him taking several minutes to get to your location, which was the actual incident. Uh, again, I, 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 it sounds like miscommunication. Yes, ma'am. 
go to my uh, civilian vacancies. Yeah. No. It just seems like if I reported something that I ought to be able to read that and make sure, because like when the officer, when she was reporting back to me, and maybe you're trying to do this, but she would, she would say, so you said, and then she would change what I said. Mm -hmm. And at the train to do that to see if you change your story, it's like, no, I'm not changing your story. My story is straight. And so she's constantly doing that. I would like to have gone back and looked at that report and see what was actually in it. But I was told I'd have to pay $10 for it. Ten dollars is the fee that we have to have to, to, to give out copies of report. I don't know how the city. I understand, but 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 I but I want you to to, to understand it too that we take about six hundred thousand calls a year uh, in that communication center that has uh, twelve vacancies uh, in it right now. Uh, so six hundred thousand calls come into that center a year. There's about another 157,000 calls that we will dispatch an officer to a location uh, based upon that calls for service. So in 600,000 calls a year, there's going to be miscommunication, there's going to be mistakes, uh, there's going to be information left out, sometimes the, the, the victim or witness. Please report for the break in. Yes. That's what I want to but there's a, there is a fee for that. Yes, ma'am. That's something that's been in place long before uh, I came here, and I couldn't tell you why that is, other than uh, that, that probably one of the answers is it's, it costs the city something to produce that. I was told it was because of people that were getting the supports for like accident victims, and then they would go and try to you know, have them come to their clinic or their chiropractic clinic. That's, that's some of it. There are individuals that come and do that. Yes, ma'am. I understand, but 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 there's a there's a fee associated with with some of our ports, and, and that's been in place for for years. And to the example that you're talking about, I don't know if that the ten dollars is the exact amount for that, uh, but I know that there are fees uh, associated with getting copies of reports. But does that seem to make sense to somebody? It's like, why should I have to pay money? I mean, it's like it's not even my property. Yes, sir. One, one thing that you can do, ma'am, for uh, property. Not for every report that we take, but for something serious like a burglary, a robbery, or something like that, all of those cases are assigned to a detective. Mm -hmm. And you can you can call and actually speak to the detective that, that's assigned to that case, and they can right, and they can touch witness. bases with you on your on what you you know to make sure the report is accurate as far as what you saw, because that's going to help us to investigate that crime. Yeah. So that's one thing that you can do is speak with the detective over that. Now that's not going to get you a copy of the report. But he can let you know what's in the report and make sure that it matches up with what you actually are all reports ten dollars they all are ten dollars uh, you have to also the reports are not verbatim uh that's a summary of, of, of the information that the officer received when he went out so it's not going to be exactly what you said but it, it should be the summary should be close to what you reported yeah to get the details right right okay, okay. thank you yes sir um, a lot of what I was hearing is you want the community to be involved. Yes, sir. And there was an incident over in Wakefield and the boys' club and, and the apartments behind it. And I called 911 three times. Young <coughs> man walking with a gun down the middle of the street, like mm. wild, wild west, down by his side, back and forth from from boys' club back and forth. Mm -hmm. And they said they wanted to arrest him, the kid that did the other one that was shooting at the apartments, but the kid that was on this side of the boys' club that kept walking back, and they never even showed up till 30, 40 minutes late. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of frustrating because I'm sitting there on the phone with 911 telling them what's going on. Mm -hmm. Even gave the address where the young boy went to. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, that's, that's a part of, of, of the frustration that we have uh, when you're going through uh, an emergency and you want a police officer uh, there like that and, and we can't always have an officer there in that kind of time, which is why you see me respectfully push back when people want us to take on additional responsibility because what you're describing is a meat and potato ABC one, two, three responsibility of police. So this is why I, I try to push back when people want to add to that because I'm struggling to get someone there that would satisfy what you thought would be a reasonable response for that kind of call for service, which at times is frustrating. They're shooting and, you know, I mean, and no response. You know, they, they responded to one section of them, but not to the yeah. And, and, I, and I would just tell you, if they're, if they're not showing up, they continue to, to call in. But one thing that we also get is a, a lot of frustration to where people, where the, where the phone will ring several times and individuals will hang up. Uh, and we tell you do not hang up because when you do so, you go to the back of the line. And one of the reasons that we have so many calls coming into the center, because 25 years ago, all of us had a landline uh, in our home. Today, everyone, about 90% of our calls are cell phone. So we have 20 people calling about the same incident that this gentleman is calling about, which makes it difficult for us to answer that phone because 20 people are calling about the same accident, the same young man walking down the street with a gun, which makes it frustrating uh, to you all when we can't get those phones or the kind of timely response uh, in some of those examples. I mean, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm saying that some of that is just part of, part of being overloaded uh, as a police department. But the cell phone has nothing to do with that, other than we ask you not to hang up. Question, that young lady, go ahead. If, if you go to our website, it gives you the information about the starting salary, uh, what, what a police officer goes through as far as the hiring process is concerned. Everyone starts as a uniform uh, patrol officer, so all of those standards and requirements are, are uh, essential for everyone starting with the police department. Now, civilian is a little bit different, uh, but for the sworn capacity, everyone starts as a uniform police officer. Uh, Uncle Willie, go ahead. Everybody saying, let's send them back to school to learn this trade. 
Man, before I, you know what, before, before I um, got into the position where I had a good job, you know what I was doing? Sam, go to Bus questions. questions. Waiting on the table, working at car wash. All this, it's a salary. That's what they want, they want a salary. Anybody in this meeting that has the means to provide a job for these young people, I'm begging and pleading with y'all to contact the mayor, the city manager, the mayor, or myself, because we out there every day to be here. And we know which one down there we really is going to go over it and make something out of itself. Thank you. Question there was a, someone that had their hand up in the back. Question, questions, questions, questions. Yes, sir, on the front row. One second. Appreciate you coming and talking to us. Thank you. I certainly appreciate our Southwest Division. You're the best of the best. I wouldn't thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Question. Yes, sir. We're new in this area. We're opening a business out here in Southwest Little Rock. And we're, we bought a property. And we want, I'd like to know, is there some guidelines, some information on what we can do to make it a safer place? We, we, ha we have uh, a, um, it's called a crime prevention through environment, environmental design. Uh, there's a young lady we have that will come out and look at your building, uh, facility, your business, and give you advice on things that you can do uh, to better protect and, and insulate yourself uh, uh, from crime. Uh, we'll have someone get, get your information here at the end to get her information. Her name is Michelle Hill. Yes, go ahead, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, one thing that is very important uh, that you should know, and there are all sorts of different ways to try and keep us safe, uh, but one of the things that people don't always think of first is how well lit or how poorly lit our city is. So uh, I issued a challenge when we launched the Rock for Life uh, that over the next 90 days, I wanted everybody before they went to bed at night Look outside and see whether your street lights are on or off. Let me tell you what. We have 20, we pay, the city pays the light bill for 24, about 24,000 street lights every month. We pay a $4 there. You can run the numbers on that, figure out how much money that is. If those street lights stay off, we're still paying the bill, number one. And you're not getting the benefit of, of the lit street. Um, and let me tell you how bad it is, or can be how bad it is. Uh, Andrew G. contracts a third party to run the frequently traveled streets of the city. So Baseline, Fire Springs, yes, so they travel up. Do you think they're traveling the neighborhood streets? No. They're not traveling the neighborhood no. streets. One night, not too long ago, I was coming back from downtown Little Rock. I was traveling on a well-traveled street, Campbell Road from City Hall. You got to the viaduct, you know, where those warehouses are, you go over, you go west. And between there and up the hill at Cavanaugh, I counted 17 streetlights out. 17 streetlights out. Now that's on a well road. So I don't have any idea on a residential street. People say, well, you know, this is not a big deal. It's a very big deal. It's a very big deal. So I'm, gonna ask, I'm asking you all, I'm asking you all tonight and every night in the next 90 days, if you see a streetlight that's out, Please make a note of the location. The intersection, mid block, uh, the, every pole's got a number on it, by the way, and that really helps to get it done. And all you gotta do is turn those into 311, real easy. Uh, and we will get that information over to energy so that they can go and deploy and get those things fixed. And then we keep up with how fast they fix them as well, which is another. But uh, we, gotta, we gotta know where they are. Um, we gotta know where they are. And the final thing is that uh, Max or Chief, you didn't uh, mention the, our neighborhood watch program and, and how many neighborhood watch programs we have here or whether we want more or need more when you talk about citizen engagement, that may be one thing you want to touch base on. Well, Chief, um, it, um, we have quite a few. Um, Are there I bring up the dark I out. I dark out. Many, I, I want them all Go back. There you go. Because, uh, we have uh, 62, as we know, is part of this in there, and that's the uh, Westwood Watch. We have Meadow Cliff, we have West Baseline, Otter Creek, Yorkwood, Deer Meadow, 
and a bunch is the ones I can get to talk off the top of my head. So we have quite a few in Ward 7, and they're very, very active. So uh, I would take, I like, I would be happy if I had 91, 92, 93 completely covered. And uh, as many people can come to the quarterly meetings, I always tell people I want as many people as I can get there, standing room only. So they have quite a few, and they're very, very active. Victoria Brown still here, Victoria. Yeah, I'm, I'm pulling up how many we have. Okay. Victoria Brown is our neighborhood coordinator that helps uh, uh, communities get organized that kind of have that collective impact through a neighborhood watch uh, standpoint. So if you live uh, in one of the areas to where you do not see uh, it blacked out from the neighborhood watch and you would like to have that, uh, for, for example, what the, what the mayor's highlighting there in 92, uh, and you would like to have a neighborhood watch in your community, uh, please see Victoria Brown after this meeting uh, to be able to do so. Do you have the total number for Southwest? Uh, yes. No, anywhere in Southwest. Give you a number again, Victoria. 918. 918-5358. Question, ma'am, go ahead. Well, it's, it's basically you collectively uh, providing some sort of protection for your area, working, to, working together as a community, uh, whether that be uh, a trash pickup, whether that be uh, knowing when your neighbors are at work, uh, knowing when your neighbors are on vacation, uh, and you all collectively working together and then also working with police to protect your community. There was a question, that I think this gentleman had his hand up. Go ahead, sir, first. What is that meeting on Wednesdays that Ms. Adcock has with the Hispanic community? Wednesdays at 1.30 at the community center, there's a meeting with stakeholders from the Hispanic community if you want to attend that. Yes. Okay. 
Got yeah, time for two more questions. Two more questions, young lady in the back. Go ahead. Um, when you first started, I asked you about uh, the Navajo system down by the river where it was going over to North, but not college, but going over to North River. Yes, ma'am. That's, that's a tower issue, uh, and I'm not sure what, if anything, we can do uh, to stop what, what tower your phone actually pings off of before it gets to the right tower. Uh, but I know that, that, that to, to answer your question short term, no. Uh, but, but I'm not sure that, that you can stop where the phone actually pings from, depending upon where you are when you're making the call. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I just want to tell somebody when calls are coming in like that, and it's 10, 15, I know it's a lot of calls coming in, but it's 10 or 15 rings and no answer in 911. What can be done about that also? Uh, before, it's, it's a great question, and it's a consistent question, but I want to reiterate something because I don't want you to leave here without this. This is why I respectfully push back when people try to add additional things to the police's plate because this is a basic elementary request from the public that you're not getting at times, which is why I respectfully cannot take on additional stuff. Now, to answer your question, uh, if you, first of all, I, again, I tell you, do not hang up when the, when the phone is ringing uh, because that puts you at the back of the line of other people who are calling in, so don't do that. The other part is try to get as much information as you possibly can so that if you have hung up, then when they do call you, you can say it was a, a, a great Toyota with license plates uh, uh, to, to get that information so that we have a good starting point for that officer who's coming uh, frustratingly uh, too slow to your response. Uh, but we try to get to our high priority calls uh, as fast as we possibly can. Obviously, some things uh, for the non-emergency, uh, they pale in comparison with that. And, 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 I, and the other example I gave you, uh, you could be in, in, in an intersection in excess of an hour or so waiting on a traffic uh, report, which is why you see us going to a civilian response for that to try to help offset some of these things uh, we're doing with the sworn police officers. Last question. Go ahead, ma'am. Now, let, let me get someone who has not asked one. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And that's probably some of the, some of the long of the calls. Yes. And uh, one thing I want to say is thank you so much for your service and your officers because uh, I want you to know you also have a support system. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs> appreciate you. And there are so many of us who are supporting what you're trying to implement here in Arkansas. Yes. Is she talking about the Citizens Police Academy? Mm-hmm. I do ask, I do say that you should go. If you have not been, I was in the same street as some of you all sitting here probably in, feeling the same way that some of you probably are feeling it today. They're not doing this, they're not doing that. It's too long for this. My husband himself has been an officer with the Chicago Police Department, and I will tell him all the time, I don't know why they came to me, why they're doing this to me. Why they, why they have to do it so rough? Mm -hmm. He said, baby, you just don't understand. <laughs> so when it was offered for me to go to this class, when they offered, Michelle Hill is offered a great, great person. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to the class. They showed some of the things that they had to endure and go through to 
office of government, they invited other officers in to talk with us to let us see some of the things that they had. I would say we also got to ride with the officers in the police car. I was scared to death. <laughs> Thank you. Last last question. Go right here, sir. I just um, I would like to say that there are a few Hispanics here that probably they don't speak English. Yes. Probably they would like to say something for us a question. Okay. Maybe if there is a police officer in translate, we can ask them. What's Gomez? You you you, you want you, you have some questions now from Hispanic from Spanish speakers? Where where is she? Yeah. Tienes pregunta? Sí, señora, pásale. Thank you. Hang on, hang on, hang on for a second. But before before he answers her, who in this room understood what she said? Okay, so we got we got two, two one or two other people. Now the reason why you see me start that slide with the importance of diversity because we've been in here for an hour and a half talking, and she has been left out of the conversation. That she feels that every day, which is why diversity is important which is why Spanish speakers is important. Uh, and I thank you for highlighting that because I should have thought about that being in Southwest with the, the larger uh, percentage of Hispanics that we have here. But this is a vivid illustration as to why diversity is important in a police department so that everyone feels like that they can come to their police department. Um, Repeat the question, Gomez. Okay. Um, her question is, uh, crimes against Hispanics, uh, like the murder we had at Bow Valley, well, now in the Spanish Valley. Uh, her question is, uh, how, how does the consulate, the Mexican consulate and the, and the police department collaborate to uh, find an end to these crimes or find, uh, uh, getting arrested? Um, and I'm about to answer her question. Basically, uh, they call us, we respond, and we try to get all the information like that murder we had, and it was mostly Spanish speaking, either witnesses or friends. So I was the only one out there at the time uh, to help interview 10 to 15 Spanish speakers. Um, and as we all know, that takes some time. So it took a couple hours to get all, the, all, all these people interviewed, and at the end of the night, uh, the Mexican consulate was notified. It, it just takes time, and it, it's, they had to get notified. It, it, it just takes time. And, and the Mexican consulate and, and a couple of his administrators was in the audience sitting here in this section. And one of the things that we do is we reach out to them and give them the information of the victim. 
many times they will coordinate with kind of the logistics to be able to get those individuals back to their native country. Now they're only for Mexico uh, for, the, for our particular city. I think that there's one for Guatemala and Houston that will work with you, but we actually reach out to them to get them that information uh, to help Hispanic families. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, I call the Consulate of Mexico on Monday after the victim, after they found out the, uh, what happened to the Mexican guy. Yes, ma'am. And he didn't know nothing about it. It was 11 o'clock in the morning. At that time, he said the police department had a phone to contact him, or he didn't say nothing about it. They didn't know nothing about that problem. So, for, for the most recent one? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, there's a miscommunication. Because the chief of police said that they were in contact and they were investigating the problem, mm -hmm. or they just said that in the news to hold attention. But the Mexico, they did not have on Monday. The the problem that you just raised was was brought to my attention uh, recently that they feel like the communication is not quicker. One of the things that I sent out today to Lieutenant Dana Jackson is the same thing that we do with the victims of violence, is to make sure that we have a person of contact, that that's their specific responsibility, to don't depend upon uh, someone in the group to do it because everyone is going to assume that he did it or he did it. So now we have someone who's individually responsible for that. And that was made uh, aware to me for the most recent uh, uh, crime that we had, which is why I invited them here tonight uh, to be here for this. Okay. Yeah. Well, obviously, there's going to be two sides to a story. Uh, I have been on record publicly and privately uh, that we do we are not an immigration uh, organization. Uh, it is not our responsibility to enforce immigration laws. We see that as a federal responsibility. The exceptions to that is when you are involved in felony crimes or violent crimes, then we will work with ICE immigration organizations to have those individuals deported because we don't want violent offenders uh, in our city. But when we have that kind of information, one of the things that, again, that I've said both publicly and privately, get the name of the officer who has asked you for that information, if they didn't have a reason to be asking you that, so that we can, can look into those kinds of things so that we don't have this kind of he said, she said of someone uh, said that I did this or that. All right, that's our time. We're uh, at 8 o'clock, so we've been here for an hour and a half. Thank you for your participation. Yeah.